Good to go. All right, well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Nick. I am a first year resident at the University of Minnesota. And today we'll be basically going over a little bit about my specialty, which is radiology and why I think it's the best kept secret in medicine. And then we'll kind of talk about the structure of residency and a little bit about art artificial intelligence because that's a pretty hot topic in the field. And then we'll go over some basic clinical cases and anatomy. And of course, please feel free to drop questions in the chat and we'll check it as we go. Um, and we'll stop and answer questions, of course. Um, and if you are not following me already um, on Instagram and TikTok, my handle is Dr. Paresis. And definitely uh, check out some of the Instagram stories that I posted and the highlights that I have and just some of the posts where I kind of talked about um, medical school and residency and things about COVID and everything in between. So um, I hope you guys find some value out of, um, out of the content that I've, that I've posted. It's been fun to kind of post um, all this stuff. And uh, of course, we'll have some humor in this presentation. Um, this is, of course, a bone and, um, you know, just a funny meme. So I find it's humorous. So we'll have some, some memes sprinkled out throughout. Uh, the presentation. So a little bit about me. Basically, I thought a map would be the easiest way to explain where I'm from. And so I am from a town in Northern California called Lodi, which is closer to a larger town called Stockton, which is closer to the capital of California, which is Sacramento, otherwise two hours away from San Francisco and the Bay Area. So I did high school and grew up out there. Um, and so after high school, I went to the University of California, Santa Cruz, and majored in molecular and cell biology. Um, I also played rugby at Santa Cruz, so I was a D1 uh, AA athlete. And then I took two gap years off, and I worked at a company called Augmetics here. And it was a company work that focused on remote medical documentation or remote scribing as you guys may be familiar with scribing in the emergency department, for example. And it was a service basically where the physician would wear the Google Glass unit. And because there is a mic and a camera on the glass unit, we can stream through the Wi-Fi, the audio and the video of the physician-patient interaction. So let's say you're a family doctor or an internist or an orthopedic surgeon in their clinic, we could help one, you know, this type of physician with their medical documentation. So I got to travel a little bit for work. I also traveled for fun. And um, it was a really great experience um, to, to have right before medical school because I got exposure to all sorts of specialties, ortho, internal medicine, family medicine, rheumatology, hematology, oncology. So it was fantastic. Um, and then for medical school, I went to the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine in Bradenton, Florida, which is confusing because the original Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine, or LECOM for short, is in Erie, Pennsylvania, and they have two campuses. So I went to the Florida campus. So after going to near the Tampa Bay area, I um, was in Bradenton for the first and second year or the preclinical years. Uh, medical school. And then I moved um, back to California to San Diego because LECOM has a clinical rotation site in San Diego. So basically they have a network of hospitals and doctors for us to complete our core rotations or our third and fourth year rotations. Um, and then after that, I, I matched at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. And I am doing my uh, intern year right now. So I'm a first year resident, and then I'll be continuing to do my diagnostic radiology residency thereafter. So um, that's a little bit about me. And some of my hobbies include traditional folk music. So I play music from the island of Crete in Greece. And it's really important to keep up your hobbies, I think, throughout medical school and just, just to stay well-rounded. So definitely don't stop what you love doing. Um, I did mention I was a D1 AA athlete in uh, at UC Santa Cruz. I did play rugby, uh, so that's a large part of my identity. And I was also a wrestler in high school. And so being an athlete uh, is definitely a huge part of my identity. Um, and then now another part of kind of what I do in my off time is uh, social media and kind of Instagram because I started posting information 
about COVID-19. And my friends who didn't work in healthcare, they were really appreciative of that because it kind of desensationalized de a lot of the news headlines that were coming out because there's so much new research coming out about the pandemic. Um, so now it's kind of morphed into um, a little bit about what's going on in my day-to-day -day in residency, what rotations am I on, what am I thinking about, what's going on in the news. And so, you know, I'm talking about the vaccines now, so definitely go check out my Instagram profile. So um, uh, I hope you guys might might like uh, uh, some of the content that I have out there. So uh, this is a picture of me at uh, my graduation in 2014. And this is a picture of my family at, in Santa Cruz. So that was a really, really uh, wonderful um, uh, memory. So um, medical school is often described as drinking from a fire hydrant because, you know, um, <laughs> medical school, there's so much information. There's just so much information that is blasted at you. And the only way to manage it is to come in from the side and take in small sips every day because otherwise it's just uh, insurmountable, uh, the amount of information that we have to know. So I think this meme is a great kind of representation of what medical school is. So just kind of know what you're signing up for because I think what you're learning is fantastic, but you know, kind of taking sips from the side of this fire hydrant every day can be exhausting. And I think another funny kind of picture to tie in together what medical school is like, it's like eating a stack of pancakes every day, except everyone loves pancakes, but everyone loves medical school and like, it's super interesting what you're learning, but having to learn all of this stuff every day, it's like someone giving you a stack of pancakes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, then you're always just gonna fall behind on eating those pancakes. So I hope that kind of makes sense and kind of resonates with you guys. Um, but I thought this was uh, probably the, the more accurate way rather than saying it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. Um, so yeah, it's like having pancakes all the time. <laughs> um, and so radiology is basically a computer job or diagnostic radiology is primarily kind of a desk job or as close as you can get to a desk job. And this is a funny cartoon of someone saying to this kid who's playing video games on their Nintendo, um, that you'll never amount to anything staring at that thing all day. And so this is a funny thing because now 30 years later, it says, you know, I'm so glad that you made something out of yourself and stopped sitting around that, uh, that screen all day long. And so radiology is, I think, fantastic because a, a lot of doctors spend a lot of time on their computer, but we, we kind of have um, like the, the coolest computer setup. So if any of this is uh, attractive to you, then definitely consider uh, radiology as a specialty. So I'll touch on kind of the, the medical aspects of radiology, then we'll go on to talk about the non-medical aspects of radiology. Then of course, kind of the reasons why I, I decided to uh, choose it as a career. And so this is kind of what a computer setup would look like or a workstation would look like for an average radiologist. You might have three or four or five uh, very high resolution monitors that cost somewhere between 10 and $20,000. So it can be, uh, each monitor can be like this, the, uh, uh, the value of a small car. And we have these really cool um, uh, desks that go up and down. And uh, the reading room is kind of multiple of these workstations, if you can imagine. It's like two or three or five or six of them in kind of a, a room. So it's kind of this office vibe. And the lights are a little bit dim so we can see the contrast in the imaging. And these, these monitors have super high resolution uh, so we can see our images uh, very, very clearly. So uh, radiology is basically the eye of medicine. So sometimes patients have, you know, abdominal pain or they slipped and fell. And then we have to see if like a, you know, if something is going on in the intra-abdominal uh, part of the body, or we have to see if a bone is broken. So sometimes we have to x-ray that or get some sort of scan. And so that could be, you know, a radiograph or an x-ray, or it could be a CT scan or a CAT scan, which is like a very, very fancy high-tech x-ray or it could be an ultrasound or a sonogram. Some of you may be familiar with that. Um, if you've had gallbladder issues or um, if, some, if one of your loved ones was pregnant, for example, then of course we have MRI or magnetic resonance imaging. Um, and that gives us even more detail of the soft tissues. And then of course we have nuclear studies where we can use radioactive materials to look at the physiology of the body in real time. So we have all these tools that are um, in our tool belt. Um, so, 
basically radiology is focused on making diagnoses. So it's primarily a diagnostic field, but we also use these diagnostics and these imaging modalities like ultrasound and x-ray, for example, to guide kind of procedures and to help us kind of treat disease as well. So it's both in diagnosis and in and, and treating disease uh, that radiology kind of excels in. Um, so we also kind of help the clinicians and the surgeons make decisions for patients clinically. So a surgeon might use our imaging findings to make a decision to do surgery on this patient or not do surgery. And same thing for, let's say, an oncologist. They may decide to change the chemotherapy regimen or to continue doing what we're doing because it may be working for this patient. And that's based on our radiology report. So, of course, we have a lot of diagnostics in radiology. We also do a lot of procedures. So I'll talk about some of the procedures we'll do uh, later, but it's really great because we get um, diagnostics, we get uh, procedural work, and we get patient care. So some of the subspecialties in radiology get more patient care than others. For example, mammography or breast imaging and interventional radiologists, they probably have the most procedures and the most patient care. So there are other subspecialties of radiology that have less procedures and less patient care, but it's not zero. So uh, just something to keep in mind. Of course, if you want to primarily do diagnostics and have, like I said, the computer job, then that's also available to you. So I think Radiology is very unique that it offers a lot of flexibility and you can kind of titrate up the amount of procedures or patient care that you would like for your own career. Um, so something else we do in radiology is protocoling. So if a doctor, let's say in the emergency department or on the internal medicine service is wondering what type of study do I order for a particular complaint? And do I order it with contrast or without contrast? Um, and so you might want to call the radiology department and ask like, which study should I order? So that would be called protocoling. So a, a radiologist or a radiology resident would basically talk to you and be like, hey, what are you looking for for this patient or what are you concerned about? And so that will kind of inform our decision on what type of imaging to order. And um, of course we have contrast reactions that we have to manage. So sometimes patients might have allergies or anaphylactic reactions to IV contrast, which may contain iodine. Um, magnetic re resonance imaging uh, or MRI contrast might have gadolinium in it. Um, and there's even like ultrasound contrast uh, uh, these days. So we've really come a long way with getting more detail with contrast. And um, yeah, so we also learned about radiation safety and we wear these little meters if we're doing procedures with live x-ray to kind of inform where we're going anatomically if we're doing a procedure. Um, for example, in the angiography suite or with a fluoroscopy machine, um, we would be monitoring how much radiation we're getting. If we're getting too much, then um, we of course could limit that by not going into the fluoroscopy suite, suite as often. Um, and of course we learn physics. So this isn't your physics that you learn in high school or in undergrad, it's not kinematics or any of those equations, it's medical physics. So it's definitely doable. And I don't think physics should be a scary thing for anyone who's considering radiology, but it's something to keep in mind that you do have to learn about medical physics and keep in mind, like we are the clinicians or the MDs and DOs, and there are other people with PhDs in medical physics who this is their life's work and they've dedicated uh, their career to furthering the field of medical physics and they are the true ex experts. So we're getting kind of the, the dumbed down version of physics uh, when it comes down to us. So something to keep in mind. This is a radiograph or an x-ray of the very first x-ray that was taken over a hundred years ago. And this is, um, I believe a German man and his, this is his wife's hand and her wedding ring. So I thought this is a beautiful photo. And you'll see kind of how far x-rays have come because you'll see some of the detail here. And of course you can see the bones here. And you'll see, we'll compare this basically to some of the imaging that we have later that has other x-rays and other types of imaging modalities like ultrasound, CT, and MRI. Um, so there are a lot of misconceptions about radiology. Hopefully I can dispel some of them and answer your guys' questions. Some people think we, dictate into a microphone, which is not untrue. We do use a dictaphone to 
say our reports. Um, some people think that we play video games, which is all good. <laughs> and some people think we're just in the dark looking at x-rays, which is also kind of true, but you know, radiologists do a lot of stuff. So I'll try and color your understanding of the field. Um, again, this is kind of what the workstation looks like. And if you're wondering kind of how many scans per shift, like do we have to look at? How many images do we have to look at? Well, the answer is it depends. So if you're reading like, MRIs and CT scans that have a lot more detail than let's say an X-ray might, it might be 20 or 30 or 50 of those scans that come in for your shift. On the other hand, if let's say it's an X-ray that you're reading, maybe anywhere from 100 to 200 of those on a shift, or if it's, you know, ultrasounds, it might be like 50 to 100 ultrasounds. So um, in a day, you may be reading anywhere from 100 to 200 scans, and it's not gonna be just one thing, it's gonna be a mixture of different imaging modalities. So uh, something to keep in mind there. Um, it is shift work. So I think that is a very positive aspect about radiology. Not all specialties have a lot of shift work. Um, so the typical hours are fairly stable. It's kind of 7.30 to 5. Or of course, if you're taking call or working an evening shift, it would be like a 8, 9, or 10, or 12 hour shift, um, uh, like overnight or whatever hours that you're working. So. Um, and in addition to that, I think vacation and salary is kind of on the upper end of most specialties. So I think this is kind of where the lifestyle component comes in. And generally doctors do work a lot of hours. So um, something to keep in mind is that doctors will work at least 45 to 50 hours per week on the low end. So vacation time is something to consider. I think on the low end for radiology, vacation time will be like four to six weeks. And then on the upper end, it might be like eight or 12 or even 16 weeks in some really, really um, kind of more rural areas where there's a higher demand for you uh, to be a radiologist. And then of course, this depends on if you're in academics or if you're in private practice or not. So the salary kind of dictates this too. So in private practice, someone may be working more and um, the salary may be higher. So you may be working more for that salary. Whereas in academics, maybe doing more of a mix of mentorship and teaching and research and other projects. And um, so salary is one, one thing to keep in mind. And there are some differences between even, you know, rural and urban um, uh, kind of practice settings. Um, one difference between academics and private practice is that in academics, if you are fellowship trained, or if you're a subspecialist in, let's say, musculoskeletal imaging or sports imaging, then you will read primarily musculoskeletal imaging. If you are in private practice, then musculoskeletal imaging will be maybe 25 to 50% of your practice. So um, something to know is that in kind of the more private practice or the more community or rural settings that you will be having uh, much more variety in what you are reading compared to the more academic, uh, large urban center uh, radiologists. So um, another aspect that I wanted to touch on that is not necessarily medical is malpractice because radiology is not the most litigated specialty. I think plastic surgery and OBGYN are numbers one and two, but I'd say it's on the medium high end of litigation because you know you can oftentimes miss a lung cancer on a chest x-ray and chest x-rays are so common. So some could go you know retroactively and kind of see that, you know, your name was on the report and you missed it. So something to keep in mind is malpractice, kind of what your threshold for litigation might be. Um, of course, this is kind of what the day in the life of a, <laughs> of a radiologist looks like. If you're wondering kind of what the day in the life looks like, you know, it is primarily a computer job. Of course, there are times in the day where you may be spending time consenting a patient, talking to them about a procedure, actually doing that procedure, of course, and then kind of, there's time for conference and for teaching and for lectures. Um, there's also time for eating, of course, and kind of doing your, your daily stuff. Uh, this is the radiologist, you know, frustrated, the radiologist working, you know, we have our coffee at our um, workstation. So um, I, I kind of like this. I, I like this kind of workflow. So if this works for you, then uh, definitely consider radiology is what I'd say. So if at this point you're wondering, you know, why did I, why did I choose radiology? Well, I have quite a few reasons, and one of them is 
um, because radiologists have a direct impact on patient outcomes. For example, like I said earlier, if a surgeon is um, deciding to do surgery or not, you know, imaging will be one data point that they use to make that decision or not. So basically what we say in the report is telling the clinicians or the doctors on the front line what is going on with the patient. So what we say in our report has a direct outcome on what's going on with patient care. Of course, like I said earlier, if you can read 100 scans per day or 200 images a day, then that means that you kind of saw 200 patients in that day. So I found this to be a very rewarding or satisfying aspect of the specialty too, because you could have more of an impact or an impact on, on more people's lives, technically, um, as a radiologist, because if you're a surgeon, then you may be doing, you know, five surgeries in a day, let's say, or seeing 20 or 30 patients in clinic if you're a primary doctor. So you can just have a, have a larger impact, I think, on patient care. So I found that to be a really cool aspect of the specialty. Of course, another cool thing is that we focus more on kind of the science and the anatomy and the disease and path pathology aspect of patient care and medicine. And we have much less paperwork and bureaucracy than other specialists. And I think this is awesome because there's oftentimes in other specialties where you're on the phone with insurance companies, dealing with things at the pharmacy, figuring out patient disposition um, situations that are, can be very complex and ordering, coordinating patient care, transportation, working with the social worker, et cetera, and so on. Um, so I, for, you know, I realized in myself that I didn't really, um, I wasn't necessarily interested in doing much of that type of work. So I wanted to really focus on kind of the science of disease and medicine. And I really, really enjoyed the breadth and diversity of pathology. So what does that mean? Basically, I wanted to be a generalist and a specialist at the same time. I, I, I wanted to, I was interested in a lot of different stuff. I liked knowing a lot about a lot of different specialties in medicine. And I also still wanted to be some sort of specialist in something. And I didn't really know what, but once I found radiology, it kind of had all of these things that kind of resonated with me. So um, we interact with specialties, you know, almost every specialty, maybe except for psychiatry, but radiologists kind of have their tentacles in almost every specialty. Um, there's also a really big emphasis on teaching and research and of course studying. So they say that the good radiologist or the good radiology resident studies at least one hour per day or reads for an hour a day. Um, they say the bad one reads for no hours a day. So for whatever that's worth. Um, there is a big emphasis on teaching and uh, in residency at noontime, we have noontime conference or a lecture of sorts to really kind of absorb the information via osmosis. So, um, you know, radiologists, uh, the attendings love to teach. And I think that's, a, that's an awesome aspect of the specialty because even throughout the day, um, even outside of conference, we will have a lot of, um, We'll have a lot of moments like teaching moments and just kind of moments where we take to take aside to kind of quickly read on something or quickly go over some sort of interesting imaging finding. So of course, radiology is very kind of high tech and I found it to be very innovative and it's really come a long way in the past 40, 50 years or even a hundred years as you saw from the x-ray uh, in the beginning. Um, and, you know, it's kind of cutting edge technology because now we have artificial intelligence algorithms and it's just, you know, the practice of radiology is going to change in 20, 30, 40 years in the future. So I think that's, um, I didn't see that as a negative thing. So we'll talk a little bit more about radiology uh, later in this presentation. Um, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, how happy are doctors in their specialty of choice? You know, are you on kind of this lower end where you would not choose your specialty again if you had to, or are you kind of, as they say here, living the dream and it's good to be me. And as you can see, radiology is kind of on the upper end of that. And, you know, it's up there with dermatology, plastics, ortho. So something, you know, something to keep in mind. This isn't to poo poo other specialties, but I think lifestyle is, it should not be taboo to talk about it. 
And I think radiology offers a really, really nice life because your work and life are often intertwined. So something to keep in mind. Of course, these are competitive specialties, um, but it's not impossible to get into radiology. So please don't feel that, you know, just because it's competitive, you know, I shouldn't uh, necessarily apply because the match rate is still 98% and still fairly high. So more reasons why I chose radiology. As I said before, you know, radiologists are generally kind of, um, you know, people switch into our specialty, but people generally don't switch out of the specialty. So once I started realizing, like when I was on the interview trail, I was like, oh, people are interviewing for radiology from surgery, from internal medicine, urology, vascular surgery, ortho, from all these other specialties. I'm like, oh, this is pretty cool. Um, like I kind of found the specialty that a lot of other people were looking for. Um, if you're figuring out kind of which specialty you're interested in, think about like, are you a thinker or are you more of a doer? And if you don't know the answer to this yet, that's okay. Basically, I found myself to be more of a thinker. So um, I find myself really enjoying kind of problem solving and putting all of the pieces of the puzzle together when it comes to um, medicine and to patient care. So just think like kind of what do I want for myself in the future? So the radiology reading room is generally a kind of lower stress environment. It's not noisy. It doesn't have the ICU bells going off. It doesn't have, you know, um, uh, patients vomiting in the hallway, for example. So it's a little bit of a more tame environment. Um, so that's not to say radiologists don't experience stress because we have to be kind of hyper um, vigilant when it comes to reading imaging because we basically can't miss anything on the imaging. So we're like always kind of mentally on. And, you know, we have to field phone calls, of course and talk to the doctors who are coming into our reading room to go over imaging. So um, that's kind of the, the reading room vibe. Uh, the vibe is like generally very chill. Um, the people there are relatively laid back and everyone's humble. You know, the ego goes kind of out the door. Um, and imaging, I, I'd say, uh, is kind of the physical exam of the 21st century. So it's kind of, you know, high tech way to look into all of the anatomy of the body and see what's going on. If, you know, a patient is having chest pain or abdominal pain or, you know, a headache. And oftentimes, you know, some doctors, um, you know, of course a history and a physical exam is far and away the, you know, the first step, the most important step to um, good patient care. You know, you have to get a good history and physical exam. But you can oftentimes only get so far with that. For example, a patient may be sedated, they may have a breathing tube put in them and they can't talk, they can't give you a history, or they can't cooperate with the physical exam, or you can only do so much of the physical exam. So this is a CT scan, and this is sometimes called the donut of truth. Um, yeah, something to keep in mind. I thought this is this is pretty cool, right? Like radiologists kind of have a lot of the answers sometimes, and I kind of enjoy that. So. Um, glad you guys are enjoying the memes here. <laughs> definitely keep this chat going. I'm, I'm definitely keeping a, keeping an eye on it. And it's fun to, to read what you guys are saying. So five more reasons why I chose radiology. So fellowship options. Some of you asked about the fellowships that we have. We have, of course, breast imaging, interventional radiology, musculoskeletal imaging or sports imaging. We have neuroimaging, which involves the brain and spinal cord. We also have pediatric imaging and nuclear medicine um, or nukes. And we also have abdominal imaging. So there's lots of fellowship options. Each of, the, each of those uh, subspecialties have kind of different um, kind of career flexibility options. So for example, interventional radiology would have a lot more call um, than some of the more diagnostic specialties. Mammography, for example, or breast imaging would have a lot more procedures and patient care than other specialties. But, you know, as I said before, I think one of the great aspects of radiology is that you could have as much or as little patient care and um, procedures as you want. So that kind of puts us in the position of the doctor's doctor. And it's not to put another doctor down. We're basically just a consultant for the imaging. We kind of own the radiology report and our name goes on it. So this is, you know, 
we're basically there for to answer any questions that any doctor might have about imaging or any provider would have about any imaging. Um, of course, because it's a computer job, this kind of lends itself nicely to remote working and teleradiology. So for example, you could work on the West Coast or in Hawaii, and your employer could be on the East Coast in New York City, for example. That's one setup because that way you can kind of capitalize on the time difference between uh, hospitals and kind of where you're living or vice versa. You could live in uh, New Zealand and your practice could be in California, for example, and you could be working days while it's nights somewhere else. So of course, kind of the computer desk job is uh, a huge plus. Um, I kind of touched on work-life balance before. You know, your work life, I think, affects your life life. And you can't, you know, it's not, it's not a hard line in between them. So you can't just split them off uh, from each other. Um, of course, physicians are notoriously um, uh, kind of have higher levels of burnout than the average um, uh, from the average population. And we have kind of higher than average, I think twice than uh, twice the kind of baseline suicide rate. So work-life balance is super, super important. And it's not only important for yourself, but it's also important for your career longevity. Like, hey, how long can I do what am I, you know, what I'm doing? Can I do it until, you know, am I going to burn out when I'm 45 or 50? Am I going to burn out after 10 years? Can I do this when I'm 65 or 70? You know, so just, I don't know, some things to, uh, to consider. Um, of course, shift work is a huge plus. I think emergency medicine also has shift work. And a lot of people go into emergency medicine for this reason. I think emergency medicine is a fantastic field. You know, you can work 15 shifts in a 30 day month, of course, and it's a great life. Um, so radiology is a little bit more kind of task oriented where basically you have like a list to get through and you're just there to get through the, the workload uh, throughout the day. So that's kind of what shift work looks like. Of course, if you are an IR, then you have to take call because there are oftentimes emergencies that only you can best take care of, like GI bleeds um, and other problems. So something to keep in mind with IR is call. Um, so this is kind of illustrating the point that, you know, an emergency physician who is asking for a scan at, you know, the minute before your shift is done is, is you know, of course we're gonna read the scan that comes in, but it's kind of a, you know, we'll read the scan and then minutes after we'll kind of get on with our day. So if it's a X-ray, then it'll only take us a few minutes to get through it. So we're not stuck there with a lot of paperwork and kind of stuck like with hours of work if something trickles in like minutes before we're supposed to leave or even 30 minutes or 40 minutes before we're supposed to leave. So kind of, I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, even if it's a CT scan that comes in or an MRI, it might take us like 30 minutes to get through it. So, you know, might be there for another 30, 40 minutes after uh, that scan is done. So, and then a lot of times hospitals on these kind of off hours are, um, you know, they have teleradiology services that are remote. So they are able to uh, get some sort of read from an, from an attending who is working remotely. Um, so, yeah, so that's one thing kind of about, about shift work. You know, radiology has kind of shifted into a shift work profession. And that also means that we provide care 24 hours a day. Um, so this is kind of a funny cartoon here because, of course, the patient wants to know, you know, I see that you're the med student. Am I the see one, do one, or teach one case? You know, <laughs> there is a motto in medicine, see one, do one, teach one. Um, and, you know, after you see a couple and do a couple, um, a couple types of procedures, you kind of get pretty, pretty good at them. So um, in musculoskeletal radiology, for example, we might do joint injections where we throw some steroids in a patient's joint. This could be a shoulder, could be a knee. We also do hip aspirations, could be a bone biopsy, could be, um, you know, a knee or, or foot or ankle joint injection. So of course we have lumbar punctures in neuroradiology, where we can put a needle and get a sample of the cerebral spinal fluid to see if a patient might have meningitis, for example. Uh, we also do myelograms in neuroradiology. In pediatric imaging, we can do intussusception reductions um, in 
abdominal imaging, we can drain an abscess, of course. In breast imaging, of course, there are biopsies to be done and patients to counsel um, on those kind of ultrasound guided biopsies. And interventional radiology does over 200 procedures. And if you are a procedures person, if you are super hands-on, I mean, this is this is the specialty to be into because it's 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 you know super high uh, high tech. It's it's very very in innovative. I don't think there's a single specialty that has as much variety for procedures as interventional radiology. And basically, IR is I would say minimally invasive procedures using image uh, imaging to kind of guide where we're going anatomically. So we can use basically any sort of vessel to get to where we're going if we want to go to a liver or the uterus or the prostate, for example. So here are some of the, the procedures that we're able to do and kind of the types of patients that we're able to help. Oftentimes it could be a patient with endometriosis or, um, or fibroids rather, with a uterine uh, artery embolization. It could be a patient um, with um, you know some sort of cancer like a hepatocellular carcinoma or a liver cancer et cetera, and so on. So we do a lot, a lot of procedures. Um, so residency. So some of you have asked about residency. So I think this is a good time to touch on that. So the first year is called intern year. That's PGY1 or post-grad year one. There's three types of intern years that you can do. You can do a transitional year, you can do an internal medicine year, or you can do a surgery year. So I am doing a transitional year at Hennepin County Medical Center. So I'm technically a University of Minnesota employee and a University of Minnesota resident um, because I'll be continuing my diagnostic radiology residency for the next four years after this first year at the University of Minnesota. So I'll be here for at least five years. So I got here by going through the match, of course. And then after that, you have fellowship. I talked about some of those um, fellowships or subspecialties within, the within radiology. Um, and some of these are right here. The exception to all of them being one year long is neurointerventional radiology, where you're almost like a minimally invasive neurosurgeon. So it's a fantastic, um, you're, it's a fantastic field. That's a two year uh, fellowship, and you know you're taking stroke call, so you might be on call for like 24 hours at a time. And there's very few neurointerventional radiologists, is my understanding. If you want to go into IR, there's three ways to get there. There's, of course, directly applying to it, where you can do, uh, you can apply directly after medical school, and then it's six years. Or you could apply to diagnostic radiology residency and do early specialization in interventional radiology, where basically you are doing diagnostics kind of halfway through, and then halfway through you transition over to being an IR resident. Of course, you could do all of this diagnostic radiology residency, so you're five years in, and then you can do a two-year fellowship. So that'd be seven years total. Or, you know, if you're doing neuro IR, it could be seven or eight years total. So something to keep in mind. Um, you know, rad primer is kind of the question bank that we use, and then core radiology is uh, kind of a basic um, book that uh, kind of a junior residents kind of start out with to, to learn from, um, and of course, study for our core exam. Um, so the studying never ends, you know, kind of the eternal student or lifelong lear learner. Um, some of you asked about uh, transitional year. Transitional year, I posted about this on my Instagram, so definitely check that out. I have a stories that, uh, I, where I just talked about this. Basically, it has a little bit more variety than internal medicine or general surgery. It has, um, you know, a, a medicine intern year will have more medical rotations where it, and a surgical intern year will have more surgical rotations. So. The transitional year has medicine, surgery, pediatrics, OBGYN, has a lot of variety. It's kind of like a third year of med school where you're doing all of those core rotations all over again. So I'm actually starting psychiatry on Monday, and then after that I have OB, and then I have trauma surgery, and then I'm finishing up with neurology. So definitely check out my Instagram stories because um, every few days I'm kind of talking about uh, what's going on and what specialties um, I'm rotating through. So at this point, if you're wondering, wait a minute, aren't radiologists going to be replaced by computers? You know, Dr. Salini is a really big YouTuber, and I think he did a fantastic video on this topic. Of course, there are other videos about this topic, but, you know, aren't computers going to kind of rule the world? Well, basically, 
AI is, you know, it's a huge field of research in radiology. It's super exciting. It's actually already been here. It's been here for a while and it's already here in mammography. You know, breast imagers will tell you it's not that great. It's also here with electrocardiograms, you know, and of course there's always gonna be a doctor who's gonna read over the EKG because computer algorithm is kind of not that great. So now the algorithms are getting a little bit better. So some physicians and non-physicians think that the algorithms will replace the radiologists. Really what's gonna happen, long story short, is that it's gonna supplement the radiologists. And it's basically gonna help us do our job better, faster, more efficient, and more accurately, you know, et cetera, and so on. So it's gonna improve patient outcomes. And that's really the end goal. It's all about patient care, right? Of course, there are lower hanging fruit than, you know, replacing the radiologist. You know, of course we do so many other things like protocoling and talking to clinicians and we do procedures, of course. And there's other lower hanging fruit that AI algorithms can take care of. For example, they could kind of give a preliminary read on an image and kind of triage it to see like, okay, is there something that is life-threatening right now that the radiologist needs to see this study stat, or it's like an emergent or urgent study that's not maybe a routine study, if that makes sense. So it's not gonna replace the radiologist. Um, it's gonna make us more efficient and it's only gonna supplement us and ultimately improve patient outcomes is kind of the thought amongst the radiology community. And so we're really embracing this technology. As you can see, the evolution of the practice of the specialty has radically changed. You know, we have a lot more imaging modalities now. Of course, we stopped with, or we started with x-rays as I showed you in the beginning. Then we kind of transitioned more to ultrasound, CT, and MRI. Then we had transcriptionists in the middle. And then at the very end, you know, some people think that AI will <laughs> kind of take over the human race. And this is the, the end of the human radiology. So um, no one has a kind of crystal ball as to what's gonna happen. So we'll see what happens. You know, one question I think to myself is what would a patient want? What would I want for my loved one or my mother or father? You know, would I want a computer algorithm to be solely responsible for what's going on with this, you know, a patient's cancer or some, some other sort of diagnosis? And then that also begs the question, you know, the computer is wondering, you know, I'm being sued for a misdiagnosis. What do I do now? You know, who is taking um, liability? Is it the programmers and the engineers who decided that they're going to create this black box of an algorithm, which no one knows how to explain. You can't ask the software tool like, hey, how did you get to your diagnosis? What was your logical or um, your, your thought process or your logic to get to where you got? And so the radiologist, you know, says to this, this robot, you know, sorry, buddy, you know, comes with a job, you know, there is liability, you know, this is why it's called the practice of medicine. It's it's never perfect. Um, humans aren't perfect. Humans are designing these algorithms. The algorithms have bias. There's a lot of literature um, about this topic, and this um, this is this is something to consider. So um, definitely keep that in mind. So who is going to take liability? I don't think it'll be the the tech companies who develop it. I think it'll ultimately be the radiologists who take the liability because the AI technology is going to be just another tool in the toolbox that we'll be able to use in our daily workflow. So those are my two cents on the specialty. We can stop here and take a few questions if you guys like, and then move on to more clinical cases. So we can go over some basic clinical anatomy and x-rays, of course, and all sorts of other imaging modalities. So we'll take a break here. Okay, awesome. Um, for the most part, you answered a lot of the questions uh, that they've been having so far, but one that has been popping up is um, just how uh, being a DO impacted your ability to get a radiology residency and if, you know, step one being pass fail will also be kind of an impact on how competitive or how hard it is to get into radiology. Yeah, those are really thoughtful questions. So I think there's around 180 or 190 uh, radiology programs 
for residency. So I'd say kind of the top 40 of those don't necessarily consider DO applicants. Um, so my answer to that is that you can't really be picky choosy with what type of medical school you go to because you just have to apply and get at least one acceptance, right? If you get two acceptances, of course you can decide between those schools, but you just gotta get your foot in the door first. Additionally, I think the match rate for DOs in radiology is actually very good. So I think the match rate for radiology as a specialty overall is like 98%. So most people can match into the specialty. Of course, it's not guaranteed that you're, you're gonna get your number one choice, but that's not guaranteed in any specialty. So I wouldn't uh, consider that, you know, I wouldn't think of that as a, as a deterrent to pursuing radiology. Obviously I'm a DO, there's multiple DOs in my program. You could uh, find our biographies on uh, the university website. You can find, you can just do a Google search, you know, to see the programs that you're interested in, like, hey, do they historically take DOs? And then kind of inform your decision to apply there or to do an away rotation as a medical student. Or if you just don't want to apply there at all, because they're not going to consider you. Um, also as a DO, you know, even when you apply to medical school, before you even start or get in, you just have to apply broadly. I would really encourage you guys, if you guys are living on the coast, to apply to the Midwest apply to the Northeast, apply to the middle of the country or in places that you wouldn't consider to live in otherwise, because you will find yourself really pleasantly surprised, I think, with the quality of the medical education and the training and the types of mentors that you're going to meet. So um, I think uh, having a diversity of experiences is something that's a really positive aspect to bringing to not only the osteopathic profession, which of course has more tr non-traditional applicants and non-traditional students, but um, just bringing it to the culture of medicine in general. So that's what I would say. You know, it's definitely, definitely um, doable to be a osteopathic physician in radiology. Um, so that's what I would say to that. Of course, the other question was um, USMLE step one being pass fail. So I think, Ultimately, this is not gonna help the DO applicant, but it's also not gonna help the MD applicant who is at a lower, low, uh, a lower ranked school. It's also not gonna help the Caribbean student. It's not gonna help an international medical graduate. So the next metric after USMLE step one is gonna be USMLE step two, because that will have a rubric on it and a scale. So, you know, the next kind of number to focus on after step one will be step two. That could be a good thing because step two has more clinical knowledge that they kind of hold us accountable for. Step one is more basic science knowledge, a lot of biochemistry and really nitty gritty details. I really kind of enjoyed step one because there's a lot of diagnostics and there's some radiology tie-ins and keywords that, um, you know, I, I learned a lot, you know, right before step one is like when you will probably have the most science knowledge ever. And then right before step two is, or right after step two will probably be the point in your career where you have the most kind of clinical knowledge uh, ever. And then after that, it's kind of like reinforcing that knowledge. So making it, you know, making step one pass fail is ultimately gonna make it, you know, it's just gonna kind of reinforce the pedigree that the culture of medicine has. And that's, it is what it is. Some of the brightest minds are at these really top notch universities and, um, it is what it is. I think you just got to do your best at every step of the way. And I think if you give your best shot at applying to med school, at taking the MCAT, doing these pre-med courses, uh, you know, excelling in your first and second year of med school, excelling on step one and step two, then if you really truly gave it your best shot, then, you know, shouldn't be any, any, any regrets. Um, at least that's, that's the way I look at things. So um, I hope that kind of resonates with you guys. Yeah, other questions or should we kind of yeah, move on? Yeah, that was awesome. Um, no, I think yeah. we can move on and then um, if we can get back to any later, we will. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, keep, the keep the chat going, guys. Um, it it's fun to see this this chat kind of being lit and like just just really active. Um, so I can tell you guys are pretty, pretty passionate about all this stuff, so good for you guys. So um, we'll start here with um, kind of, let's see. 
some uh, CT chest anatomy, and we saw a little bit of X-ray anatomy. Um, let's see, how can I go backwards? There we go. So this is a chest X-ray. So this is a frontwards and forwards view. Um, the lungs look more black or more radiolucent or lucent, and things like bones and other soft tissues that are more dense, they appear more opaque or radiopaque or more white on imaging, if that makes sense. Of course, the image here is inverted. So this is the patient's left side. And this is the patient's right side. And then you can see a lot of the anatomy labeled here. We have the airway or the trachea. We have the carina where the airway kind of bifurcates. We have the clavicles up here. Of course, we have medial and distal clavicles. Medial just means closer to the midline, of course. Distal means farther away from that. We have the scapula here, scapula over here. We have some you know, C6, C7, T1 vertebra. Um, we have the apex, upper zone, middle zone, and lower zones of the lungs. And that's, of course, bilateral. It's on both sides. We have some anterior ribs here and posterior ribs, or these are the ribs in the back, and then these are the ribs kind of coming in the front. Um, so that's kind of what anterior means. Here on the sides, you can see what's labeled as the costophrenic angles. Sometimes fluid can hide in here, like a pleural effusion, or um, you know, it could be blood or bile, and it could kind of blunt this uh, kind of blunt this costophrenic angle. So this is oftentimes where we look for uh, for things to hide. Of course, we have the cardiomedicinal silhouette and the heart, of course. And there is, there's many, many anatomical structures here, as you can um, probably imagine. So, of course, we have the diaphragms here, left and right hemidiaphragm. The stomach sits here, then the liver sits here. So maybe keep this imaging in mind as we go forward into some of these clinical cases. I only have four cases for you guys. So, um, again, this is a CT scan. So I just want you to compare this to the x-ray. looks a little bit different. So the CT scan has a little bit more um, uh, detail. And so, of course, you can see a lot of the same anatomy here. You can see kind of the airway a little bit better. Um, of course, you can see the bronchi. And then we have all of the lobes of the, of the liver, of the oblique fissure here. I talked about the liver before. Um, uh, I said the, the, sorry, these are the lung, the lobes of the lung. I think I said the liver. Uh, of course, the liver sits here. We have the stomach here, the spleen is here. And yeah, it's really cool to see the different types of scans. And of course the heart has different chambers. Um, you have the left atrium here and the aorta that comes out of the heart. So yeah, just kind of keep this in mind once you kind of look at this imaging. So this first case is a 65 year old female and just drop in the chat kind of what you think might be going on or what your differential diagnosis might be. Of course, this is a chest x-ray and this patient has a history of COPD or lung disease, which is most often caused by uh, smoking or smoking tobacco. This patient presents with fever, so we might say that she is febrile. She also presents with dyspnea and shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, problems breathing. So. After talking to her, you might find out that she has sputum production that is yellow or yucky or green in color, kind of this mucus that's hacking up. And you talk to her some more, you might find out that she has chest pain. That chest pain might be what's called pleuritic in nature. So a pleuritic chest pain means that when you inspire or take a deep breath, that causes chest pain. So this patient might have chest pain on the right side because this is the right side of the patient. Um, if you look at the patient's vital signs, of course, they might have an elevated heart rate or an elevated respiratory rate. And breathing fast basically is called tachypnea and a fast heart rate is called tachycardia. So you guys are doing great right here. Um, if we do an exam on the patient, we might do a physical exam and auscultate with our stethoscope and listen and hear that there are crackles on the right side, of course, where these arrows are pointing and you guys are so far nailing the diagnosis, you know, we might decide to get some sort of basic blood work or a complete blood count. And in that complete blood count, it's a type of lab that can look at white blood cells. And 
if the white blood cells are elevated, that can be a sign called leukocytosis, which means that white blood cells might be elevated in the setting of infection or inflammation. So you guys are doing great because this is a classic bacterial pneumonia. And the way we, we might describe this in the radiology report is a right lower lobe opacity. So this is opaque or radio opaque, right? Because it's more dense and this consolidation should not be here. As you can tell, comparing to the previous x-rays and to the other side of this patient's lung. So nice job. And this is a pneumonia. So it's super common. Um, speaking of pneumonias, this is, as you can tell, a COVID pneumonia. This is a CT scan. And this is what we call, or the way we would describe this is called peripheral ground glass opacities or junkiness in the lungs or schmutz. And this is consolidation of, of the lungs. So this should not be here. So this is kind of a COVID-19 pneumonia. You also see some vascular dilation. And this graphic is from uh, this really nice Instagram account, The Radiology Guy. So definitely go check out some of his posts. And I think his anatomy overlays are really, really beautiful. So I've included them, uh, some of them here for you guys. So we obviously look at the chest front and backwards. And that's called AP or PA view, anterior posterior, posterior, uh, posterior anterior. So that just means it has to do with the way that we shoot the x-ray. So it's also very important if you can get, is to get a side view or a lateral view. And because if you're only looking from the, from the front, you're looking at a two dimensional image of a three dimensional object. And this is one example of that. You might think, oh, this is going on, but then actually look and just see like, oh, okay, this is going on. So if we look at the kind of anatomy, we could see that things might hide behind the sternum or retrosternally or retrocardiac. So it kind of helps us triangulate where something is sitting in the chest. So always, always get a lateral view if you're already a chest x-ray, and that's called kind of a two-view chest x-ray. So something to keep in mind. And this is another kind of meme to kind of drive home that point, because looking at things one way doesn't always tell the entire picture. Of course, there are certain instances where a patient is sedated or you know paralyzed, God forbid, and they can't um, they can't move or they can't actually get the lateral X-ray. So that's okay. We can only get one view. So we'll kind of take what we can get and do what we can with that. So. This is the next case, and we'll have four cases total. So this patient is a 58-year-old male, has a history of coronary artery disease or heart disease, and this has, uh, you know, two arrows or an arrow here labeled, and another arrow here labeled. So in radiology terms, we might call this kind of um, uh, positive arrow sign as kind of a joke, because we already know that something is there that it shouldn't be there. So let me know what you guys think in the chat box here and keep the chat going. So just kind of keep the differential diagnosis going on in your brain. Um, this patient also presents with shortness of breath or dyspnea or problems breathing. They also have what's called orthopnea, which means that they get relief when they sit up in bed and maybe they're uh, having this shortness of breath at night and they're having trouble breathing at night. And they're using two pillows to sit themselves up. So you might ask them, like, how, how many pillows are you using to sleep at night? And they might tell you, I'm using three pillows or two pillows. And that's called orthopnea. If we're looking at vital signs, of course, we can look at respiratory rate. And if it's over kind of 20 or 22, we might call that tachycardia. So that'd be an elevated respiratory rate. This patient has a respiratory rate of 30 per minute. So we can also look at other vital signs, like, of course, the saturation of oxygen, and that might be 90%. We kind of ideally want that to be at least over 92%, if not 95% and over. So this patient has kind of low oxygen levels, of course. You know, why might, why might this be happening? So we might auscultate the patient like we did the last one, we might listen to their lungs and hear what's called rails, which is a particular type of lung sound. Um, and then of course we can get labs. On the last patient, we got uh, a CBC, where we looked at the white blood cell count and showed that it was elevated. So you guys are nailing the diagnosis right now. I'm really proud of you guys. 
and the elevated BNP or brain natriuretic peptide. That is something that um, is very specific for particular diagnosis, which you guys have already mentioned. So I'll just go on um, here and kind of describe what's going on radiologically. So this is what's called fluffy kind of bilateral, which means they're on both sides. Um, Periohylar, which means that they're near both sides of the hilum. And we might call this a bat wing configuration because they're on both sides of uh, the lungs here or an angel wing configuration. This is pulmonary alveolar edema or pulmonary edema, uh, or in other words, fluid in the lungs. And so given this patient's history of heart disease and orthopnea and all of this, you know, especially the elevated BNP, this would be pulmonary edema to, uh, you know, secondary to congestive heart failure. So sometimes fluid can back up into the lungs from the heart failing as a pump. So um, someone asked here, did you find it difficult to learn how to read an x-ray? So I, so you do learn some basics in medical school about reading chest x-rays because they're so common and all sorts of doctors will actually be able to read uh, imaging. So oftentimes orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons, they can read their own imaging really, really well. But, um, you know, radio, medical school is kind of like a prerequisite to doing radiology. So I don't really actually know that much radiology as a first year resident. So of course I might know a little bit more than average than the non-radiology resident, but those residents would know more about their own specialty. Let's say it's anesthesiology or physiatry than I would about their specialty. So, um, it, you know, it, it is difficult, but to me, it's, um, uh, it's enjoyable to kind of put all the pieces of the puzzle together and it's very visual. So it's, um, it's cool. Um, and of course, getting priors or looking at previous imaging that a patient had is super, super important. So this is, of course, a silly little meme from the office and corporate needs you to find the differences between the, this picture and, and this picture. So um, oftentimes we might do that because if our last patient came in with this type of x-ray, this would obviously be different than this type of x-ray. So maybe that might inform us like what is going on. Um, or if they had a previous x-ray that kind of looked like this, like they already had this before, and then today's imaging looks similar to what they had before, then we could more confidently call it, you know, what it is, let's say pulmonary edema or pneumonia, for example. So looking at priors is super important also for tuberculosis. Um, moving on to other kind of imaging modalities, of course, there is ultrasound of the abdomen. We can look at pancreas, the liver here, of course, the aorta and the IVC. Um, there's uh, some more abdominal imaging here for you guys, um, or what we might call cross-sectional imaging. You can see the psoas muscles here. Of course, you can see the discs here, the intervertebral discs and the vertebra. You can see the aorta coming in again here, the stomach, the spleen, the kidney, some intestine here, the jejunum. Yeah, it's really cool. I'm glad you guys find this stuff really cool. Um, of course, you see the right kidney here. Sometimes patients may not, may not have one of these organs because they had it taken out. They might have surgical clips left in where their gallbladder used to be, or they might have a kidney missing, or they might have a horseshoe kidney where these kidneys are connected. So there's a lot of like really um, kind of anatomical variants that we have to know about, and also just things that can happen surgically that we have to know what they look like on imaging. Of course, the liver is here. Um, you can see some of the muscles here, glute medius and bladder, of course. So uh, yes, that is a CT scan. Um, this is another abdominal CT scan with anatomy here. We can see many of the same organs that we saw just in a different uh, field of view. So this is a similar field of view as well. Um, cross-sectional imaging, because it's kind of like taking a cross-section of the abdomen, if you can imagine. And it takes a little bit of imagination, but you, know, you can kind of orient yourself with spleen and liver and kind of the spinal cord, you know, CSF over here and some of the back muscles like the erector spinae. Um, yeah, someone's saying here, my brain is just soaking all of it up. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I find myself in the same, I find myself in that same position every day or like the more time you spend with the radiologist in the reading room, you just kind of through osmosis, you will pick some of this stuff up. Um, of course, if none of this labeling was here, I probably won't know, uh, you know, I don't have all of this memorized quite yet. Of course, as a radiologist, I will, I will know more, 
um, you know, at the end of my training, I will kind of have all this down, all this stuff down pat. Um, and this is an abdominal MRI, and this is a little bit different if we compare it to an abdominal CT scan. Um, let's go back here. So it's a little bit different, right? So I just want to kind of compare contrast MRI versus CT scan. So here's a pelvic MRI. This might be used to look at the prostate gland for, let's say, BPH or benign prosthetic hyperplasia. And as we get further down the body, you know, of course, we also look at abdominal radiographs. You know, what is going on here? What do you guys think this could be? So someone's saying that these are honestly really beautiful and I feel like I'm looking at art. And a lot of radiologists, I think, are into photography. You know, I, I think I have a kind of a creative side to, to myself. And so I, I like to think um, that I'm, I don't know, I like art or photography. Uh, but yeah, what do you guys think this object is? So yesterday was Friday, actually. And in the radiology Instagram community, there's what's called Foreign Body Friday. So you guys are crushing it right now. This is a foreign body. Yes, that is a jar. What kind of jar do you guys think it is? And where do you guys think it is? So I'll, uh, <laughs> someone said jam here. Yeah, mason jar. Yep, so we see all sorts of things come into the emergency department. And obviously, a lot of time we'll get, um, you know, drug smugglers or people who are going to be incarcerated. And we need to do an x-ray like this because they might have drugs somewhere or a little baggie somewhere. Um, so we need to see if there's, you know, they may get some sort of uh, toxic, uh, you know, toxic uh, poisoning or delayed kind of overdose. Um, and this is a cookie jar. So, you know, yesterday was Ford and Body Friday. And although it's not Friday, I think this was still kind of a funny kind of tie-in. And this is a meme from weeks ago. I hope you guys appreciate it. What do you guys think it is? Like, do you see it? I'm not gonna point at it with my cursor quite yet, but yeah, you guys are seeing it right here. Um, I posted it on my Instagram and people found, uh, found it pretty funny. So, um, you know, it's pretty pretty low resolution kind of image compared to this, <laughs> but yeah. Nice job guys. So again, this is the radiology guy. I just wanted to go over some basic anatomy and kind of compare what an X-ray would look like if it wasn't labeled like this. So um, you can see again, all of the bones here, radius, ulna, styloid process, of course, scaphoid is often uh, fractured. Um, so we'll just continue moving on and see some more anatomy. Another really beautiful overlay by the, uh, by the same account here. Um, of course, the trachea is in the front here. This is what it would look like without all of the uh, labeling. And then of course, look at the shoulder, humeral head, surgical neck, of course, um, all of this really, really beautiful stuff. And of course there is vasculature all up in here. So we can't forget about that. Uh, the radiologist is responsible for everything in the x-ray. So just because you're getting a chest x-ray and looking the, at the heart and the lungs, it doesn't mean that you're not responsible for the shoulders at the periphery. So again here, we're looking at the knee and you can see some of the vessels here, popliteal, um, of course, is the patella. And then, you know, see the femur coming down here and the tibia over here, the fibula, again, another kind of anatomy overlay here. This is a fantastic, fantastic account on Instagram. Um, yeah, someone's asking where are these diagrams from. Some of these are from the radiologists, of course, and then some of them are from the other Instagram account um, that I mentioned, kind of the radiology guy. So we'll go into um, two more cases, and this one will be 45-year-old male, and this patient has a history of head trauma. So this might prompt the doctor to get a head CT or a CT scan of the brain. So this patient may have slipped on ice and hit their head, for example. So the radiologist might describe this as lenticular shaped, lens shaped, hyper intense lesion. Of course, it's on the left side here. What do you guys think is going on here? Um, yeah, you guys are doing really well. So hematoma, good. Uh, you know, we see a fracture in the left frontal bone. See this little fracture here. This should not be here, of course. The arrow is telling us it shouldn't be there. Um, of course, we see this. So what do you guys think? Of course, intracranial pressure is what you guys are saying. Okay, good, good. That's something that we would think about. Um, this is what we would call a type of brain bleed. There's many different types of brain bleeds, of course. There is 
an epidural hematoma. There's also subdural hematomas. There's intracerebral hemorrhage, um, and there's subarachnoid hemorrhage. So there's so many different types of brain bleeds. This is just one type of them. So I think this is a this is a good one to know about. So epidural hematoma is what we would classically classically kind of call this. Um, sometimes patients don't know that a fracture is the same thing as a broken bone. And that's okay because radiologists, we need to strive to do better uh, to kind of educate the public on what we do and kind of what our workflow looks like. So this meme is like, I was so relieved that the doctor said it was fractured. You know, I was afraid it was broken, but broken means fractured and fractured means broken. Of course, we can see the broken bone right here. Um, that is a uh, no bueno, but yeah. So moving on to a little bit of more kind of neuroradiology, we can see anatomy here again, you know, cerebellum, really important for our balance, of course. We have the occipital lobe, parietal lobe, frontal lobe. Corpus callosum kind of connects both the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere of the brain. We have the ventricle here, the lateral ventricle, the thalamus, midbrain, pons, medulla, and then of course the spinal cord here. You can see even the tongue here and kind of the heart palate. So we'll just kind of move on to kind of this last um, this last case here. So this case, you know, you can see kind of where the arrows are pointing. So obviously those uh, should not be there um, and indicate that it is pathological. So this is a classic, classic demographic for this diagnosis that we're going to get to. And so think of, you know, drop your differential here in the chat. This is a 40 year old female, blurry vision, the past two weeks, you know, could be um, a, a decrease in their visual acuity. It could be double vision or it could be blurry vision. Um, they could have difficulty walking if you're asking them. Someone said stroke, MS, Alzheimer's, you guys are doing really, really well. Could be a tumor, of course. Um, the way we would describe these possibly if you're a radiologist is periventricular, which means near the ventricles. Uh, these are globular foci. So of course we saw where the lateral ventricle was on the last slide. No, globular foci. Um, so yeah, what do you guys think here? Nice, so you guys nailed it. So it is multiple sclerosis. And in MS, you know, you get these what's called kind of plaques. So these are kind of periventricular globular plaques. So these should not be there. Um, super common diagnosis. I'm sure many of you know a loved one or a friend or a family friend who might have this diagnosis, which is um, unfortunate. So this really quick, it's kind of a seven Tesla, 100 micron brain MRI of a 58 year old female who died of non-neurological causes. And basically they took her brain and it was donated as a specimen and it was put in a MRI scanner with a huge magnet. It had seven Tesla strength and not all magnets have this strength. Oftentimes they're only like three Tesla. They can go up to like 10, 10 and a half Tesla or so. And so this has super, super high detail. So this is gonna be a really great um, uh, contribution to medical research and to advancing kind of medical science and the study of neurology and of course neuroanatomy. So um, I thought you guys might find this beautiful and I apologize for the lag here, but you know, you can find this, uh, this video here on YouTube. Um, kind of moving on here. If you are interested in radiology and all of this kind of piques your interest, um, here are some resources for you guys. Feel free to just take a quick, quick screenshot of um, all these kind of Instagram and YouTube accounts. And a lot of these people are on TikTok as well. You know, we talked about Dr. Salini, um, Dr. Sindhu, uh, Dr. Yasha Gupta, all, you know, all of these accounts are just fantastic. And the radiology community is just, um, it's a very, very positive place on social media and all that. I think Ben White has a fantastic blog. I think um, the Amster guide, if you are a medical student, is, is, is the go-to place to um, kind of figure out how to apply and all that stuff. Of course, the Tums podcast, someone commented here that they really like it. Uh, radsresident.com, once you're actually a resident or a fourth year medical student, this is a awesome question and answer blog. So um, 
you know, in summary, people think radiology is easy. We just sit in the chair and read images, but obviously there is a lot of gray area and there's a lot of black and white, but it's not all black and white. There's some gray area. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. Let me know if you have any questions here. We'll spend some time doing a Q&A. Definitely follow me on Instagram if you have not already. My Instagram handle is Dr. Paresis. And of course, I'm on TikTok. One of my TikToks got like, uh, I think it had like 100K here when I took this picture. It has like almost 150K now. It's just like a, a cool like kind of day in the life. Um, definitely check out my Instagram profile. I have a lot of information about COVID-19, the vaccines, for example, kind of overviews on the rotations that I've done, like burn surgery or internal medicine, and um, of course, emergency medicine, which I'm just wrapping up. And uh, let a friend know if you find this information helpful. Of course, feel free to send me a DM on uh, Instagram. I check them pretty, uh, pretty regularly. And this is a picture of me with my brother, and my brother's a current uh, dental student. And I think it's really important to keep up those connections with your family, with your friends, with your hobbies to keep you really well rounded. And I'm playing the mandolin here. My brother is playing the lute. These instruments are from the island of Crete. Um, you know, our family is Greek, so our Greek heritage is something that we, um, it's a really large part of our identity. So yeah, let me know if you, if you guys have any questions here. We'll, uh, we'll definitely get to that right now. I think there were a couple of questions we can get to. Um, one of them being um, just a little bit more about like technology and how you think AI is gonna be um, incorporated. Uh, do you think that even though it could help, um, it could help radiologists, do you think the technology advancements also could lead to decrease in the um, need for radiologists in the future? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I don't know is my answer because I don't have a crystal ball and I haven't been in the So yeah, someone asked about um the need for radiologists to go down. So possibly, possibly not. You know, people have say have been saying that AI is going to replace a radiologist for so many, so many years. I think the first algorithm that came out was in like 1976 or something. And it was talking about how it's going to replace the hospitalists. So I don't think hospitalists have gone anywhere. So I think there's always going to be this uh, this fear of uh, technology kind of taking over the, the world. But I would I would just look into it for yourself. This is you know kind of the experts in the in the field are saying that it's going to supplement our job. It's not like our jobs are going to um, vanish or anything. You know, it might bring um, healthcare resources uh, to people who did not have them before. I think that's a very positive aspect. It might also bring the cost of healthcare down because if all of a sudden I can get through a lot more images a lot faster and a lot more accurately, um, maybe I don't have to. Um, they don't have to. Um, you know, if you buy an MRI scanner or a CT scanner, they cost a lot of money. So the hospital could make their money back a little faster, if that makes sense. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, do you think, uh, or can you tell us if you know um, how different interventional radiology is um, in comparison to interventional cardiology, or are they kind of like hand in hand? Um, I would say that they are hand in hand. That's also a great question. IR is uh, separate because we, of course, do so many different procedures and interventional cardiologists have kind of taken over um, um, kind of the domain of the heart, obviously. So there is what's called kind of a turf war. There's a good episode on the undifferentiated medical student on the podcast. I think there's a few IR doctors who are on there. They kind of talk about this turf war because oftentimes the interventional radiologist will have developed a certain procedure, and then another type of doctor will want to be able to do that procedure so that they can get, of course, reimbursement for it. Now, oftentimes they are the primary doctor for that patient. So instead of having to consult a specialist like an IR physician, um, they'll want to um, have that kind of um, that tool in, in their own domain. So 
um, we, I think, are all colleagues and we all kind of work together. So there's no like real animosity, if that's what the question was getting to. Um, I think interventional radiologists probably work the closest with vascular surgeons because the field is basically called VIR or vascular and interventional radiology because you're in the angiography suite and you're using live x-ray to basically using the vessels and live imaging with an x-ray or fluoroscopy machine to figure out where you want to go. If you want to go um, like to the liver, for example, to go ablate a tumor or to do a Y90 procedure where you're putting um, kind of radioactive uh, medicine to kind of shrink a tumor. So I hope that answers kind of that question, but definitely look into it for yourself. Ask IR doctors, ask interventionalists, ask cardiologists, you know, what's your, what's your take on the field? Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's really great to know. Um, I guess we'll do two more questions. Uh, someone asked earlier on um, what the difference is between, um, you know, a PED scan versus an adult scan. Yeah, so we do, uh, we do learn about pediatric radiology in residency. So I don't know that I would necessarily describe the scan as different. Of course, there are certain imaging modalities that are specific um, for um, the pediatric population. For example, you can do ultrasound of the head for babies. And we can't necessarily do that for, or we just don't necessarily do that for adults. So fetal kind of cranial uh, ultrasound is one thing that is different or unique for the pediatric radi radiology patient population. Um, we oftentimes get what's called baby grams or like a chest x-ray of a baby. So of course the anatomy is different. Also the pathology is different. So a lot of diseases that, are, that happen in childhood don't happen in adulthood and vice versa. Um, of course, kind of the classic like cases that I presented might not be um, classic for the pediatric population. In the pediatric population, you have to consider diagnoses that might be more uncommon or like they might be like rare congenital diagnoses that have uh, kind of a genetic predisposition to their pathophysiology. So I hope that kind of answered that question. But a lot of the principles are the same. It's just that the pathology and the diseases that you have to learn about are a little different. Yeah, great. Thank you for so much for clarifying that. Um, I guess we'll wrap up with this last question, but um, the, if you could give us any piece of advice as um, pre-med students um, during the pandemic and kind of having a lack of resources to get experience and stuff, um, do you have any like last piece of just A1 advice for us? My biggest piece of advice it's hard to answer a question like that because I don't want to be too cliche or anything or too general. And it's basically just, you know, just do your best because if you put your best foot forward in my eyes, or at least this is my school of thought, if you put your best foot forward and you're always proud of the work that you've done or that you are doing, then once you're done with that and the outcome, um, Maybe you know you weren't satisfied with the outcome, or you're like, it's just if you've done your best, then there's less room for regret or um, feelings that I could have done better because maybe you really couldn't have done better. And if you did your best, then you did your best. Like I was a pretty average student. I was never like 4.0 or you know the smartest person in the room, and that's okay. Um, so, but I just tried to do my best. So just, you know, showing up is half the battle, right? So if you just show up, put your best foot forward, people will see that people will, will see that you're like really putting in some elbow grease, that you're really trying, that you're showing up, that you're interested, you're engaged, you're curious, you're, you know, thinking, you're, um, seeing yourself in this profession Then, of course, figure out if you want to be a physician, do you even want to be in medicine? Um, because you know, being a physician is is a unique, um, I think, uh, position to be in in healthcare. So I think it's a it's a fantastic field. And so don't you know? Also, don't listen to the naysayers because a lot of pre med counselors they have not gone to medical school, and a lot of uh, deans in medical schools they have PhDs and 
let's say anatomy or this, that, and the other, but how much advice can they give you on like taking USMLE or taking Comlex or the boards or anything like that if they haven't done it themselves? So just like listen to people who are like one or two or three or four years ahead of you, reach out to them, ask them questions, see what they wish they knew, kind of like how you guys are doing. And I think just make the most of it. I think what you guys are doing here is like, this is, this is the best thing. This, you're making the best of, uh, of what, you're, what you're given, uh, I think. So just kind of seek mentorship from people who are a little bit ahead of you, just to kind of, kind of get the upper edge and see uh, kind of what's going on. So that's my best advice is just seek good mentorship and do your best or try your best. <laughs> so I hope, uh, I hope so some much. of this was, was helpful for you guys and kind of um, gave you guys in insight into the specialty. Yeah, absolutely. This was incredible. I mean, you can see in the chat, everyone said, thank you. This was so great. The memes were amazing. So <laughs> thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, and we wish you the best um, with the rest of your residency. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, I, I'm so happy that you guys like the memes. That makes me really happy. Uh, definitely send me memes on Instagram if you guys see a good one, because I, I like saving a good meme and, and using it. Maybe I'll use one in, a, in another presentation. So definitely stay connected, everyone. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a good night. Take care. Have a good night. Bye.